first of all, the architects, the main players in the battle. Uh, this man needs no introduction. This is actually a, a, a painting that hangs of him in the in the RA, Royal Air Force Club, wearing Air Commodore uniform. Um, but uh, Churchill was a very important man, obviously, and made some pretty important statements as well. This man, Lord Dowding, he's really the architect of the Battle of Britain. And but for him, I man one hell of a lot, quite frankly, because uh, he saw uh, World War II coming in the mid-1930s. And at that point, he that, that is when he started preparing for it as well. And when I say preparing for it, I mean planning, um, planning sort of how the defence of the UK was going to be structured. And more about that in a moment. Things like radar and locations, um, command and control, um, and not to mention the uh, aircraft themselves. Um, very important man. Had his headquarters at Ari of Bedley Priory. This man. A class with the uh, Dowding. This is uh, Air Vice Marshal, as he was in the Battle of Britain, Sir Keith Park, later Air Chief Marshal. A New Zealander, he commanded 11 Group in the battle, and it's 11 Group that I'm going to be talking about mainly tonight, but I'll show you how they fitted in in a little while. But he was uh, a real leader of men, a New Zealander, and uh, both he and Dowding are remembered to this day. There are statues of them around the place as the the real architects uh, of the battle. They led. They led us through the battle, planned it, and led us through. Under, of course, Churchill. Just incidentally, just after the battle had been completed in December that year, both uh, Dowding and uh, Park were removed from their jobs. Um, by um, and in their place came uh, to replace Park came uh, another air vice marshal called Lee Mallory who actually was commanding another group during the Battle of Britain, and there wasn't much love lost between uh, Park and, and Mallory. At the same time, sort of uh, Lord Douglas replaced uh, Lord D Dowdy, and there wasn't much love lost between those two either. But uh, uh, the uh, Dowdy's replacement was in Parliament, so he had sort of a, a bit of a sway on things. Now, these are the, uh, where the just at numbers. You see there's 2,300 from the UK. I don't, I'm not going to go through them sort of uh, one by one, but I, I will point out a, a, a few things. Um, firstly, the large number that came from Poland and Czechoslovakia, and uh, the Poles, uh, both those, uh, were great fighters in the battle, the Poles in particular. Because, of course, Poland was the first country to be invaded by uh, Hitler at the start of the war. It was what started the war, really. And and uh, they were subjected to all sorts of horrors and what have you. And the, and the Polish have never forgotten that. And they, the pilots who came from Poland, they escaped from Poland, and they found their way to the UK. And uh, they formed into Polish squadrons in the UK. And they were real fighter pilots, they were. Um, 32 from Australia, a lot from New Zealand, you see. From South Africa, 25. Well, my father was one of those 25. Um, and you can see the others. But um, from America, to USA got nine there. In fact, uh, of course, the USA were not in the uh, battle at that stage. They didn't come in until the attack on Pearl Harbor. But uh, these were Americans who'd volunteered and come across uh, to volunteer for the uh, uh, to, to join the RAF in the battle. Very important people. And they went on to help form uh, other squadrons when the United States entered the uh, the, the war later on. Uh, the aircraft involved, and I'm not going to go through all the aircraft involved, but there were lots of them. The main players in the battle were obviously the Spitfire, and there are more Spitfires. There are one or two Hurricanes in there too. Uh, there are the Hurricanes. Uh, these are DO-17 German bombers, um, and, and there are a lot of bombers, obviously, involved from Germany. This is the Junkers 88. Um, and there was a Heinkel bomber as well. Then you've got the ME-109, huge numbers of 109s, both fighters and fighter bombers. Everybody remembers the Battle of Britain because we remember the, we, we remember the pilots, 
known as the few. Um, but really, sort of, we mustn't never forget the many as well. Uh, and the other, the other key ingredients to uh, the battle and the success behind it, the chain radar, uh, the, the fact that uh, Dowding had sort of a, had, had uh, overseen um, the introduction of uh, radar was a great help during the battle, even though it was very raw in those days. It did enable um, the uh, commanders to understand sort of from where uh, the aircraft were massing to uh, uh, attack from, and they could sort of uh, organize their forces accordingly. Radar played a significant part in the battle, as did the ground crew. Without, without the ground crew and what they did to keep the aircraft going, those aircraft would 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 uh, not have been able to do what they did. Headquarters and administrative staff, obviously, headquarters people like uh, Dowding and Park were basically located in headquarters. Um, and take fighter command, for example, where there were plotters and goodness knows um, and, and others there. And then on on stations themselves, all the administrative staff that looked after sort of a, the provision of. Uh, Food, accommodation, you name it, they, they, they were there. The Observer Corps played a very important part in sort of a, uh, with their lookout around the coast. The Air Transport Auxiliary, the ATA, we only got really properly recognized about uh, 15 years ago when they got uh, given a, a badge, mainly sort of uh, females, but not entirely. Um, and they would deliver the aircraft from the factories uh, to the front line. Um, and that meant that um, the front line didn't have to sort of uh, release pilots to go pick up these aircraft. So they played a pretty important part. Um, and there's some really good stories that uh, come out of the ATA. Um, and they, 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 flew, they, they flew these aircraft without radios. Um, sometimes they'd climb into a big Lancaster um, and they'd have no training on it. And be just told basics and get going. Um, and then industry, sort of, because industry had to sort of gear up and sort of produce the uh, replacement fighters. And right at the start of the uh, Battle of Britain, um, I'm not going to go through the exact numbers because they're always disputed, but suffice to say that the Luftwaffe had um, many, many more fighters than uh, um, the RAF. I could say double would be about uh, right, and the same with sort of uh, pilots as well. And uh, aircraft, the, uh, the the industry sort of produced a lot more aircraft much quicker than the Luftwaffe ever sort of imagined they would. And they played a very important part. Now, uh, Fighter Command, based at Bentley Priory, this map is just a map of the UK and, and shows... Um, the radar coverage uh, that uh, was was available through chain radar, and but um, the fighter command was was broken up into groups, ranging from ten group down in the southwest, eleven group, twelve twelve group in the middle, going up to thirteen group up in the north. But it's um, uh, they're sh shown there by dotted lines. I don't know whether you can see me sort of playing playing with them. There's a line there, another line there and a line there. Um, but we're going to concentrate on 11 Group. Um, and here, 11 Group was broken up into sectors. And you can see on this map um, how the uh, sectors were, were, were arranged within 11 Group, commanded by Sir Keith Park uh, from um, RAF Uxbridge, North Holt as well. Um, and these are where basically sort of the squadrons were based. Uh, my father, in fact, was based at Kenley, um, just south of London, near, near Croydon. Now, the, the phases of the battle itself, four phases. The first, as I said, it lasted from the 10th of July uh, to the 31st of October. So really, you could take this sort of back into July as well. But certainly sort of from the 8th until the 18th of August, these are dates that are recognised. Um, the Luftwaffe threw mass formations against uh, shipping in the Channel and against the airfields in southeast England. That was just to sort of uh, um, loosen up and sort of uh, 
uh, weaken the, uh, the defences so they could move forward. And then on the 19th of August, they went into phase two, which was basically sort of attacks on more inland airfields. Uh, and the Germans at this stage, said, and uh, as time went on, by September time, they thought the fighting defences were severely weakened and the RAF was on its knees. Um, and that's when sort of bases like Biggin Hill and Kenley sort of really suffered from uh, attacks. And then from the 6th of uh, September, uh, they switched their tactics from uh, attacks on these airfields uh, to attacks on London, which there were 38 major attacks between 6th of September and 5th of October. Um, and this was, uh, it was, the, R the RAF was really suffering when, they, when the Luftwaffe made this decision. It was a decision that uh, helped uh, the RAF considerably because it meant that they could sort of uh, uh, re, they could they could mend their bases, they could mend their aircraft, and they could uh, um, start sort of preparing for better things. So it helped them a lot. So that, that was the attack on tax on London, and we were talking about that phase in particular. And then uh, sort of uh, from the fifth of October until the end of the Battle of Britain, um, it was day into night attacks on London involving fighters and fighter bombers. This is just a slide I put in. This, 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 this is phase one of the Battle of Britain. As I said, phase one was when uh, uh, the Luftwaffe were, were uh, basically attacking ships in the, in the channel. They were attacking ports and they were attacking coastal airfields. And this just shows um, one day, 15th of August, of, of the number of attacks and where they, where they attacked. And you can see it quite clearly there. But now we come to the 15th of September, Battle of Britain Day. This is the weather chart for the morning of the 15th of September. And it's fairly important. Um, meteorology, as I know only too well being a pilot myself, a second generation fighter pilot, the weather is always vitally important to any, any pilot and what you're doing. And this morning was no exception because um, the isobars are fairly close, which means that there's fairly strong winds there. Another little sort of uh, ploy, just to give you an idea, um, you always learn, uh, pilots learn that uh, with your back to a wind, the low pressure is always on the left hand side. The low pressure is up there. So a pilot standing with the back to the wind down here, then it's pretty obvious that the wind is coming from the northwest. At um, 18,000 feet, the wind was 80 knots. That's pretty strong. And that's about the height that the uh, uh, Luftwaffe were flying across. And this, I'm mentioning all this because this played a pretty important part in what happened that day because it meant the, uh, the Luftwaffe flying from uh, France had a, a fairly, were coming further, but they were coming into a headwind which was slowing them down considerably. This in turn, because they were being slowed down, things, it meant that uh, the RAF fighters were having uh, uh, more time to climb to height and be in position for when the Luftwaffe crossed the coast or when they, when they were engaged. Um, but um, also, um, the uh, Luftwaffe uh, uh, pilots, because the aircraft were taking much longer to get to their targets, um, they were using fuel in the process. This meant that, uh, in particular for the uh, ME 109s, the fighters, the fighters uh, did not have enough uh, uh, as much fuel to play uh, to get involved in a fight as they might have liked, and so they sort of uh, had to beat it back to uh, France as quickly as possible and leave their bombers in some cases. Now, this here uh, shows you sort of basically uh, Park and Dowding knew because uh, of the change in tactics and obviously intelligence and what have you, um, that the, uh, the Germans were going to sort of be aiming at London. Right at the front there were about 50 um, 109 fighters. And they were there to sort of, uh, you know, start getting involved uh, in the battle and then you see 253 that was my father's squadron right in the front line there behind them were 25 um dornier 17 bombers and they had with them about another 30 or so um, 109 fighters and behind them were 21 um me 109 fighter bombers um and there were so the 109 was not just a fighter, it was a fighter bomber as well. And um, with those fighter bombers were another 50 or so 109s. Now in the wind, what happened, in fact, is that um, 
uh, the most of the b bombers actually got to London. They did. Um, and the 109 were the first bombers to get there. Uh, and the, the RAF hadn't recognized that the, the 109s actually overtook the, uh, the rest, the other bombers on their way and were the first bombers to get there. But because they were, they looked like 109s, um, the RAF sort of hadn't sort of, uh, were look, they were trying to stop the bombers getting in. And they take on the fighters when they sort of, uh, um, uh, either sort of engage with them or on, on the way out. But it was the bombers were the important things because they're the ones who are going to cause the damage. But what happened in this is the bombers did get to London and they did sort of uh, uh, drop their bombs, the 109s first, but then the fighters had to sort of beat it, beat it off back to uh, um, France as quickly as possible. And a lot of bombers got shot down after they dropped their bombs in this particular occasion. Um, claims, there were claims and counterclaims and... Um, the statistics, I can give you some statistics, but uh, I think they're still argued about uh, today. Suffice to say that uh, um, a lot of German aircraft were shot down, both uh, bombers and fighters. And the RAF on this raid, I think they lost about 13 aircraft. But there were 23 RAF squadrons involved in this particular raid. This happened in the morning of the 15th of September. Um, and this, this was actually there at about uh, 11.50, I think it was. In the afternoon, not very long after, came an even bigger raid. And I'm not going to, I will go through the numbers because I said there were 25 Dornier bombers in the morning. In the afternoon raid, there were 117 uh, bombers. And there were about 450 um, 109 fighters involved as well. Also some ME 110s. And the RAF got uh, into the air 28 squadrons. And they had a total of um, something like sort of 270 um, Spitfires and Hurricanes um, there. But whatever, throughout all this, you could see that um, actually the Luftwaffe numbers outnumbered the RAF by something like two to one. So they came in the same route. And again, um, the, you know, picked, they were picked up on chain radar to identify where they're coming from. The squadrons were in place, and basically, sort of, uh, Keith Park, who was the commander of 11 Group, had uh, positioned his squadrons, 19 uh, to the north yeah. and to the east, to take on the aircraft as they sort of uh, approached the, uh, um, the the capital. Uh, there was a big wing coming down from Duxford uh, uh, as well. Um, this is where also the weather played a useful part on this occasion as well. Unlike today, where when you can see through clouds and you can you you know you've got all sorts of equipment to uh, clouds don't don't get in the way really very much at all, but in World War Two they did, and London in the afternoon of the fifteenth of September uh, clouded over with cloud, and so the bombers could not see their targets. The result of that was that uh, they didn't hit most of their targets, and um, they took on sort of they they dropped, had to drop their bombs, so they bought they dropped their bombs on random targets. There were big battles ensued, um, and I think it was uh, something like 30 bombers were shot down and 20-something uh, um, fighters. Uh, the, the RAF losses were about half that, um, but the claims were much greater. Um, but um, whatever, it was important. What, what the Germans saw on this was that the RAF was there in some force, 23 squadrons in the morning, 28 squadrons in the afternoon, and there were normally sort of 11 of them in a squadron. Um, but in particular, when I mentioned that the the big um, uh, the big raids that came from the north, the big wing raids, uh, weren't as effective as uh, the way Park was operating his Spitfires and Hurricanes uh, in the 11 group. But the uh, Germans did see, when they saw 55, formations of 55, Spitfires uh, coming towards them, then they could see quite obviously that uh, um, the RAF was not sort of knocked out of the sky at all. Basically, the RAF to the Germans had far more resources than they thought they had. And that's what was reported back. Also, by this stage, this, remember, this is uh, well into the Battle of Britain stage, and the, both sides were losing a lot. 
uh, but the RAF was managing to replenish uh, its stock, its uh, aircraft at a lot lot quicker rate than the Germans were. Um, and basically, with winter coming on, uh, the Germans realised that the RAF was still strong, um, and that, uh, that really sort of they hadn't sort of knocked them, out, uh, knocked them out of the sky at all. And that is what this that it was because of what happened on September the fifteenth. These raids that uh, two days later, on September the 17th, uh, Hitler made the decision to uh, postpone uh, Operation Sea Lion, which was the invasion of Britain. And believe me, he had uh, uh, multi-forces uh, lined up on the other side, ready for the invasion. Um, so that was a very key, that, and of course, never happened. So the Battle of Britain is key because it was the what the... RAF pilots did, supported by everything on the ground, um, that basically uh, stopped the Germans invading uh, the UK. This chap's called Peter Pease, and he was killed on twenty first of on, on the uh, on the eight, eight, on the fifteenth of September on Battle of Britain Day, twenty one. Getting confused there because he was twenty one years old. He was the son of uh, Lord Richmond. Up in uh, in uh, Yorkshire, um, he was an aristocrat. Basically, he was at Cambridge University at the time, and a lot of the Battle of Britain pilots had come from places like Cambridge and Oxford University. Indeed, Oxford, uh, I'm told, provided something like 500 pilots for the RAF in World War Two. But uh, Peter Pease um, was on 603 Squadron uh, when he was killed. He was very friendly with. Uh, other well-known um, Battle of Britain pilots, Richard Hillary in particular, who wrote the book about uh, him be, himself being shot down and and uh, his face being. So this is this is uh, typical. There's a lovely, lovely painting of him that hangs in the RAF club uh, as well. And that was the average age, really, of the Battle of Britain pilots. Twenty-one. They were mere youngsters. The youngest was. Uh, 18. Um, my father was actually a bit older. He was 25 in, when he entered the battle. So that's Peter Pease. And now I'd like to go and talk a bit about my father. He was uh, born in South Africa, although the um, family sort of uh, come from Scotland, basically, and we still got a, a family firm in Edinburgh. But he was born in South Africa and educated there. And he joined the RAF just before the war. Um, whilst he was in southern Rhodesia. He was one of 11 pilots recruited from southern Rhodesia, and he was trained in 1938, and he started the war flying um, ferry battles. In fact, he was in France uh, from September to September 1939 to June 1940 uh, flying ferry battles. And here's a ferry battle here. It's not an RAF pilot standing by because this is June, um, and this is a, an aircraft that's just been left there. And in, in fact, my father, um, he was in, if you think about when sort of the evacuation took place, it was uh, um, at the beginning of June, but um, he, he was he, he didn't leave uh, France until middle of June. And in fact, the very first uh, entry in his current logbook, his only logbook, but it's a very thick one, um, was first logbook lost during the evacuation of France. Well, I put this up because, I mean, I, I've got no two real records of uh, what he uh, did too much because I've, although I've got, I have obtained Operation Logs, which I'm going to read and find out exactly what the squadrons were doing or what my father was doing then. Uh, but uh, not many ferry battles um, survived. Most were shot down or left there or blown up. And, most, and a lot of, a lot of uh, ferry battle pilots were killed. Mind you, a lot of pilots were killed in, in France, uh, full stop. So he came back to, to the UK and then he converted to the Hurricane and um, joined initially number 615 squadron and then he went to 253 squadron at uh, Kenley uh, for the Battle of Britain. And my father there is actually in the middle row. He's the one in uniform. He's the third one that, where I'm pointing at now. That is, that is my father there. So he was in the battle, saw out the battle. And then at the end of December uh, 1940, after the battle completed, 
Um, he was posted off to, not to Malta at this stage, but he, he literally went to North Africa for a while. And um, in January, he was posted, uh, he, he was um, ordered to get into Malta because the air battles were really sort of hotting up over Malta. And he went to Malta and uh, joined 261 Squadron uh, there. And as this is him, he's sitting on the ground. As you look at the photograph, he's on the left there. And uh, he, he he's an ace. He's got quite a few kills from the war. Uh, but he certainly sort of got quite a few kills in, uh, in Malta, uh, both bombers and fighters. And he was shot down himself. And this is his. He was shot down twice, in fact. And this is the pho photograph of his first uh, force landing. In, in a hurricane and what it looked like um, afterwards. And that took place in Malta. So he was in Malta for uh, um, half, probably half that year and then went off uh, to Egypt uh, for a while, getting very frustrated because he wanted to be back on the front line. And then he joined the hurricane squadron and they were on a, an aircraft carrier heading for uh, war when Singapore fell and the squadron was diverted into uh, Ceylon. And they landed on Colombo Racecourse. This photograph here is in Colombo now. That's my father on the left-hand side. The chap with the pipe is uh, a chap called Sir Peter Fletcher. Peter Fletcher, who rode, went on to become Sir Peter Fletcher, Air Chief Marshal Sir Peter Fletcher. And he w went on to become the Lieutenant Governor of the island of Guernsey as well. This is them on 257 Squadron, I think it was, in Colombo. My father flew in there in March, end of March 1942, and on the 5th of uh, um, April 1942, Easter, which was Easter weekend, it was Easter Sunday, in fact, the Japanese um, surprise attacked Colombo, and um, they, they had a big battle. And uh, my father shot down a Zero and another Japanese aircraft, but he was shot down himself, and this is his second one, and this, this I think, was a bit worse than the first one. Um, and incidentally, I have actually met uh, the Japanese pilot who shot down my father. He didn't, but um, when I was in the Air Force, I got a call from a, a, an author friend of mine, and he said, Rick, um, you won't believe this, but we've had a call, been approached by a Japanese, par ex Jap Japanese pilot from the war who'd like to meet the two British pilots that he shot down. Uh, my father was one, and uh, they, they searched the records and discovered that that he was one and the other was a Navy pilot. Um, my father had died by this stage, but the Navy pilot was uh, uh, alive. So I represented my father and, and I went to went to meet him, which was, uh, it was quite an experience. Um, that is, after he got shot down, he had uh, shrapnel wounds um, in his eyes and, and uh, in his legs as well. He got carted off to hospital. Uh, and in hospital, I so I'm told the story goes, he, he, he he, he couldn't stay there, so he literally sort of just walked out of hospital. Uh, and this is him having walked out of hospital with uh, obviously his face bandaged up, a, a fag hanging out of his uh, his mouth, and still in sort of um, his hospital pajamas, I think, he'd been given. And below that, he's got a sari sort of type thing on. Uh, he was off flying for a, a month, but then back into the air. So that's what uh, happened to him. Those are my father's medals, actually. The, this is the frame. They prepared a very nice frame with uh, as typical of uh, the other frames they've got, and that's displayed at Bentley Frari. Um, I should add, it's not given to them; it's on loan from me, because um, I, if I, I, I'm far happier to have my oops, sorry, have my father's medals um, displayed somewhere than sitting in a drawer back at my house here. Uh, so it's much more effective. So it's on. It's on a three-year loan to them, but quite frankly, it is on permanent loan as far as I'm concerned. But the important thing is that these medals are still owed, owned by me and my family. And that is really important because so many Battle of Britain pilots, families have sold off their medals, in some cases at vast, making vast amount of money in the process. But to me, the most Precious possessions I've got are my father's logbook and his medals. So they're not for sale as far as I'm concerned. Now, this this um, actually shows uh, not the board at uh, Bentley Priory, because just down the road is the bunker at Uxbridge, 
Um, and this is where more plotting goes on. This is where the from where, where Park was involved. And this actually on September the fifteenth, Battle of Britain Day, um, was where uh, Churchill was. And Churchill was famous. He sort of turned around. Downing was down there on that day uh, with him. And he tur Churchill turned to Downing and said, um, "How many aircraft have you got in reserve?" And Downing said, "Nothing." And that was true. And Downing sort of uh, made many decisions. He stood up against the politicians. For example, the politicians wanted to send um, more hurricanes uh, into uh, fr France during uh, when, when the French uh, battle was, was on. And he said, no, we need to keep these aircraft back here to prepare for what the attacks that are coming on uh, the UK. And he won. He said, I'm doing that. And those were, that was a very important sort of a, um, you know, a decision that was made because it meant there were sufficient fighters there at the start of the Battle of Britain to uh, to do do something. Um, so that that was exactly sort of what the situation was. It was pretty pretty dire, but it was pretty dire throughout. In fact, until the Germans um, made the decision not to invade Britain. So this has then been plotting, and obviously, sort of, uh, you've got various commanders uh, up up the top, sort of uh, liaising with uh, other with units around the place. Um, I should add that uh, the bunker at Huxbridge is exactly as it was in 1940. And and if you if you when you go down there, you will see sort of uh, uh, the location of squadrons at the exact time, exactly where they were. I remember going down there myself, and I could see exactly what what my father was doing at uh, 11:50, 12 o'clock on September the 15th, 1940. It's a special place. When RAF Uxbridge closed, the bunker was handed over to um, Hillingdon District Council. And I will praise Hillingdon here because uh, about five or six million pounds has been spent on the preservation of uh, this facility. It's got a fantastic new visitor center um, on the surface. Um, and um, there's an auditorium there. There are excellent sort of uh, uh, modern facilities there. And so that itself, if you start at Bentley Priory, remember Bentley Priory being the headquarters of the Fighter Command, Uxbridge and Northolt, really sort of uh, the next next most important players in the, uh, in the in the battle. And then it's down to the, the bases. So these two, uh, uh, Bentley Priory and Uxbridge, are important places to visit. Other places that are important... This is Duxford, um, where this is 12 Group, but this is where Lee, which is Lee Mallory's group. This is where Douglas Bader was based, and Douglas Bader was sort of uh, very influential on sort of uh, putting together the big wings, uh, which, as I said, sort of uh, did have their uh, play, role to play in the Battle of Britain, but were cumbersome to sort of uh, really get involved in, in a fight. But today, if you go to Duxford, it is a real museum, and there is what a lot to see there about the Battle of Britain and many other things as well. And I should say that all these places, there are the other ancillary sort of places to visit as well, like um, hostelries, which the, which the uh, pilots uh, frequented. This here is uh, a Belfast hangar at Duxford, in fact, um, and this is when it was blown up. Um, during the filming of the Battle of Britain film. So you, you, I'm sure you've all seen that, but if you if you do have a chance to have a look at it, this is when it was blown up at Duxford. It's never been replaced either, which is a pity. Um, then there's Capel of Fern down in Kent. Um, and this is where the Battle of Britain Memorial um, Trust is, is located, and the Battle of Britain Memorial. It's basically on the White Cliffs. Um, and it is an amazing place. It's got, uh, again, it's, it's, it, they got a lottery grant or a heritage grant, and uh, they spent about five million pounds on it. And it's got um, um, the new building sort of uh, in the shape of a Spitfire wing, um, encloses a fantastic experience called the Scramble Experience. And it's very moving, and it's very sort of... Uh, Virtual, uh, you can go in there and you can you can really 
you can you can, there's so much to see in that one facility about the Battle of Britain. It is amazing. It starts with a film, which I know my good good friend who was on the 92 squadron, which is one of my old squadrons, was uh, he was on 92 in in the Battle of Britain. A chap called Geoffrey Wellham, who I'm sure you might have heard of, who wrote an excellent book called First Light. But uh, he's been in, in there several times, and he always comes out with tears in his eyes. And I must admit, first, when I've seen the film, it brings a tear to my eye. But I've always said that sort of uh, anybody who has a British passport, as far as I'm concerned, they should have a rule, um, a rule of life. And that is at some stage in your life, you visit places like uh, Capital of Fern, and you get a tick on your passport to say, this is the capital of Fern. Because it's through places like this that uh, we help uh, future generations to remember um, what their ancestors did and why they are where they, why they have the freedom today uh, that they, they are lucky to have. So this is a very special place. Another place that's had billions spent on it. And this is um, capital of Fern as well. This is the wall they've got there, um, and there's, there, are, there are the names of every single Battle of Britain pilot there. And I go to their Memorial Day in July every year, and I lay a wreath in front of my father's name. Uh, the statue here, you see, is uh, Keith Park, in fact, and there's another one of Lord Dowding as well. So that's a special place. A few other photographs. This is uh, Lord Dowding towards the end of his life, obviously. And uh, that's Douglas Bader behind them. On his right is uh, Stanford Tuck. Um, and uh, on the right-hand side of uh, the photograph, you'll recognise Peter Townsend. Anyway, suffice to say, they're all Battle of Britain pilots. And uh, there were a few more uh, then than there are now because there is actually one Battle of Britain pilot still alive. His name is John Hemingway. He lives in Ireland, and he's 104. And he's the last, last surviving member of the few. This is not so long ago, a few years ago. They're not all Battle of Britain pilots there. This is down at um, Capital of Fern again. The lady in the middle is a, 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 a lady called Mary Ellis, who died at 101, and she was an ATA pilot uh, who came from the Isle of Wight. Um, so they've gone now, but they'll never be forgotten. That's all I'll say. This is the memorial at uh, Capital of Fern. Memorial to the few. And of course, we must never remind ourselves of Churchill's words. Never has so much been owned by so many to so few. Lest we forget. <laughs>